Good evening, everybody. Warwick Henry, President of AHSA Queensland. Uh, it's nice to be back here in this old building full of history from way back in 1940-41. And uh, acknowledge all the people who have been flying out of Archerfield since 1929. Uh, pleased to be back here and thank uh, we thank Archfield Airport Corporation for making space available for us. And this building, for those who don't know it, is one of three of this type built in Archerfield, Mascot, Sydney, and Parafield, Adelaide in 1940-41. Uh, all, all these buildings are heritage listed and they still exist. However, the one in Sydney is very hard to find. It's got bits of Qantas's building around it. But if you're driving up to the people's drop down, drop off area, you can just see the back of the building there. Um, and this departure lounge has been turned into a museum of sorts and it's been for people who've been here before, it's got even more uh, signs and photographs and information boards all around the whole area here. Uh, we welcome our country members and interstate members of AHSA in different places, and good to have you all with us. We had a couple of visitors here, Mike Gannaway, who'd been in AHSA a long time ago, and Alan Graham. And you've heard that Don Furlonger Bob can't be here tonight, and Don Furlong, our committee member, has damaged his, badly, damaged his knee badly and can't come tonight, but we've got him in mind. Tonight, we've got a special visitor, the new Archerfield Airport Corporation business manager, Elita Hyun. Uh, Elita, would you like to come say a few words? Thank you. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Elita. Um, no. Like the president said, I'm the new business manager here. Uh, previously, before that, I was a lecturer at USQ and I taught the Bachelors of Aviation. Um, I'm currently also doing my PhD in aviation um, in passengers' perception of safety uh, in Australian airlines. Uh, I, my background is in academia, so I've I've always been in academ academics since I started. So uh, it's just such a good opportunity right now to uh, have this new role and join everyone here tonight as well and learn more about the Aviation Historical Society. Thank you, Alita. Just uh, before we start properly or completely, I mentioned the next few meetings we're going to have on 27th of May, Dana Dennis Baker will be our speaker talking about saving the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation slash Hawker de Havilland Company historical records. And in June, Daryl Burdham, then we saw talking about Ambly Uh where we talk about the Jindalee over the horizon radar. And in July, Ian Campbell, we're talking on a subject called, he thinks he's a bird. In August, Mark Pilkington, we were talking about the CAC Wacket and the Yeoman Cropmaster. Uh, any questions to start with? No, I'm ready to hand over now to our speaker, Tony, and he's going to be talking about the Empire, the Empire has no. an answer. The Empire strikes the Empire back. Has no. the Not quite. I won't need that one. I've got this yes. one. So thank you very much for inviting me along, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the talk obviously is on the Empire Air Training Scheme. Peter's just whacking that up for us now. And it's called a grandiose project with somewhat Wellsian flavour, which the title will become apparent very shortly. Okay, so um, this draws on research that um, came from a fellowship I won for the Air Force in 2014. So paid for and, and covered by the Air Force on a small grant, which is now their fellowship program, the CAF fellowship program, I think it's called. Um, I researched it, I had no, I had any topic I could choose. Um, I chose the Empire Training Scheme. Um, I had no knowledge of it beforehand. And my methodology was to base it on newspapers of the day predominantly. So I say it's based on 35,000 newspaper articles. It's actually closer to 65,000, but a lot of those duplicate each other. So I said 35 independent um, stories, basically. Um, so the Empire Air Training Scheme was described as probably the greatest single cooperative undertaking ever attempted by the British Commonwealth of Nations. Churchill stated it was the master plan that sped the Allies on the road to victory. 
So he said above all, all else, the Empire Training Scheme won the war. And Sir Kingsley Wood, the British Secretary of Air, described the Empire Air Training Scheme as a grandiose project with a somewhat Wellsian flavour. So that science fiction HG Wells sting to it. So that's where the title comes from. So one of the questions I get asked often is, um, is about the newspapers as my primary source. And did I really read all of them? And the answer to that is yes. Um, the second part is, did I really use 35,000? Well, the answer to that, as we've already covered, is no. I used a lot more than that. So you look at 35,000 independent newspaper articles across Australia, and why did I choose the newspaper articles of the day? Because primary source newspaper articles were a really good source of getting an accurate read on what people, what people thought at the time. Um, newspapers at the time, not the conglomerates we see now, the newspaper man was the local man who lived in the town. Every little town had a newspaper or maybe even two. And that guy went to church with the people in town. He bought his groceries at local grocery store. He shopped. His children went to school with the other people. And if he didn't live up to the reputation that people wanted, he didn't survive in that local town. So the news had to report what was happening so people could see what was going on. Now, um, from my research, I've, I've got, besides the ones you can see up on the board there, and I've just put a couple of examples to give you some of the more varied ones. I used all the essential ones like the, the Advertiser, the Age, the Argus, the Canberra Times, Courier Mail, Adelaide News, Sydney Morning Herald, Telegraph, and the West Australian, all included. However, um, at this time in history, most newspapers were not amalgamated, as I said. So you end up with things like um, the Don Derrigo Gazette and Guy Fawkes Advocate. The Cessnock, yeah, true. The Cessnock Eagle and South Maitland Recorder, the Blythe Agriculturalist, the Laura Standard and Crystal Brook Courier, the Cadinda and Wallaroo Times, the Northern Murchison and Pilbara Gazette. Newspapers like these, as I said, were owned by the individuals and they lived with these people. So consequently, these newspapers provide a unique first-hand account of the communities that lived experiences through the war years. And when all these newspapers are combined, you get an accurate account of what the war was like through the eyes of the Australian public and the individual experience of the vast number of people who contributed to it. Um, one of the, the beauties of this is that, that soldiers, as well as airmen and Navy, who were recruited, would write letters home to their parents. And if they're from a small area like, you know, the Riverine Herald, they might their mum would then take their letter into the local newspaper man who would publish it for all these friends and families and people to read. So you get a, 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 an account of all these personal letters written home from all these people. So that actually built to the, the accounts as well. So as you can see there, there's some, some great um, quotes, the Northern Standard, for example, the Empire scheme would turn the balance of power in favour of the Allies, so they're in favour of more than 50,000 Australians will take part in the Empire Air Training Scheme. Uh, in his report, Mr Lyon lays stress that the government aims to secure Australia from attack. Um, so they're all talking about using the Empire Air Training Scheme as a defence within Australia as well. So this gives you an idea of what we're going to do. So to give you an idea of what we're going to run through, I'll start by providing the overview of the Empire Air Training Scheme. Then we'll look at how Australia went about finding and preparing the right people for the task in the limited pool of resources. Um, and this will cover the blue trains used to recruit in the country areas and the 21 lessons that were designed to increase the academic level of, of the recruits. Uh, next, we'll look at those in command anticipated that war would not be as short as Hitler anticipated. Hitler said, um, you know, th this will be over before you train your first air crew. And um, the reason my book's called The Empire Has an Answer is the answer came back was, if Mr Hitler thinks this war will be over, the empire has an answer. So that's where the title of the book comes from. Uh, so we'll look at um, how it was anticipated and how they instigated the, the WAF to take over men's roles to try and alleviate all the, the capable men to go off to flying positions that they could. And um, we'll also look at how, um, how future air training um, cadets were trained through the instigation of the Air Training Corps. So they developed the Air Training Corps as a way to train the, the 14 to 16 year olds for future careers in the military. Uh, then a qu quick look at the training of various aircrew roles, um, followed by an explanation of what an Article 15 squadron is um, and how it was formed on the Empire Training Team. 
and how those that served in the RAF around the world who weren't in, Empire, weren't in um, Article 15 squadrons. And finally, we'll look at some of the more common myths associated with the Empire Training Scheme um, and why, in my opinion, the, and it's my opinion, why the Empire Training Scheme is so little known about in Australia. I'm talking to an educated audience here, which is, which is a rarity. Normally, I'm talking to people who've never heard of the Empire Training Scheme and don't realise how much Australia put into it. So we'll look at the alliances, myths and legacies. Okay, so what was the Empire Training Scheme? The plan to have the British Dominions train air crews for the RAF, RAF, in the war against the Axis pow uh, powers during World War II came about through an idea presented to the British by Stanley Bruce and Vincent Massey, who at the time were the Australian and Canadian High Commissioners in London. Uh, that'll be contested by a friend of mine very shortly. Uh, two men realised that the capitulation of France, that the only way that they could, the Allies could take the war to Germany was through an air war. So once France capitulated, there was no land battle that they could take to Germany. It had to be an air war. And they knew that, um, that Britain wouldn't have the manpower to service its army and navy, as well as an expanding air force. Um, they also knew that to fly across occupied Europe and bomb Germany and its resources would make it an absolutely high attrition war. And to build a heavy bomber at the time is reported it would take 12 weeks while training an air crew to fly that bomber would take more than 12 months total. So obviously there's a need for advanced planning and a resupply of air crews. So they realized that and they presented the idea for the Empire Training Scheme. So the plan to help the Dominions recruit and was to help the, uh, have the Dominions help recruit and train air crews um, and put them into action. Now, the agreement was negotiated in Ottawa on the 27th of November, 1939, and Australia signed a two-way agreement. Now, this is a, a, an intriguing little point. Most people only ever talk about the four-way agreement. Australia signed a two-way agreement at that stage on the 27th of November, 1939, between Australia and Britain. The agreement was initially effective until 31st of March 1943 and called for Australia to commit £55 million pound to recruit and train 26,000 air crew, build air, airfields and training facilities to accommodate this training and to manufacture the many aircraft that will be needed in the training. So that was the two-way agreement. Now, the one that's more commonly known about, the four-way agreement, so it was the second one. And it was called the four-way agreement, as I just said, and it was signed on the 17th of December, 1939. The Australian delegation at that stage, headed by Fairburn, had already parted. They, they had what they wanted. Um, and that agreement was signed on Australia's behalf. This agreement between Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United Kingdom um, was the four-way agreement. Now, originally the plan called for initial training of recruits in the home country. This is what was proposed and then all further air training to be conducted in Canada. But James Fairburn, the Australian Minister for Air at the time, realised that this would be paying Canada to build up their air power and that this money was best spent in Australia expanding its own air power. Consequently, Australia agreed to fully train seven ninths of all of the air crew in Australia and send two ninths to Canada after they had passed initial training. The seven ninths formed the agreement between Australia and Britain, which was a two-way agreement, and the two ninths formed the four-way agreement between the four countries. Together, these agreements to all up became known as the Australian and New Zealand, in Australia and New Zealand as the Empire Air Training Scheme, or EATS, while in Canada, it's called the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, um, and Britain calls it the Joint Training Plan, and you often see it just referred to as the plan. At the start of World War II, Australia had to give you an idea of the comp uh, completeness of this training play program, Australia had just one flying training school, as we know in Point Cook, with 16 instructors and less than 3,500 personnel in only 22 units. So that's at the start of the war. By 29 November 1944, the RAF had 183,822 personnel in 480 individual units, making it the fourth largest air force in the world. Now, for those that aren't good at math on the spot, that's 50 times or a 5,000% increase expansion in five years. Anyone who's ever been in business and knows what it takes to train people and put in infrastructure and all the things that's required to actually train a person will realise how extensive that is. So this plan was massive. The Empire Air Training Scheme accounted for the training of almost half the pilots, navigators, flight engineers, wireless operators, bomb aimers and air gunners that served in the Royal Australian Air Force 
Royal New Zealand Air Force, Royal Canadian Air Force, and the Royal Air Force during World War II. It remained the single largest aviation training program in history, and it's acknowledged as being the single most influential factor in the Allies winning World War II. So how did we find all these people and, and get the right men, right men for the right job? So 1939, Australia had a population of seven, 7 million people, around 7 million, of which only 900,000 were men aged between 19 and 35, making them eligible for air crew. That meant that there was a very limited pool for air crew roles. Of course, not all these men, so if you take 900,000, not all these men were suitably educated, physically fit enough, or desired to join the RAF. And that made the pool even smaller. So if you think the RAF's now out trying to recruit for the Empire Training Scheme for all these air crews, 900,000 men possible, which is depleted by those that are physically unfit, et cetera, et cetera, and not educated well enough. So they had to find a way to get the right ones quickly. Um, and the, the worry was that everyone wanted to go and serve. So the worry was that the army would actually eat up a lot of the eligible people that would be suitable for air crew before they actually found them. So those in command and had anticipated a lengthy war and knew that they had another 320,000 boys aged between 15 and 18 that were considered the future recruitment pool. So they put that aside. However, the fear was that those mentally and physically capable of performing air crew roles may join the other forces before they could be found and recruited for the RAF. Additionally, many of these men were in rural areas and it was economically unviable to bring all the potential air crew to the cities for testing. You couldn't just bring every farm boy in and say, are you suitable for air crew? Um, it just wasn't viable. So the answer became something called the blue trains. Um, these were especially built recruitment trains set up to tour along the state rail lines to test and recruit air crew roles. Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales had two blue trains. South Australia and Western Australia had one each. Um, newspapers would advertise. Every, anyone seen a Cinderella stamp? What's called a Cinderella stamp? Um, you know, at Christmas time, you send out your Christmas letters, you might stick on a little Santa sticker on the thing. That's a Cinderella stamp. Okay, so in the old days, you used to have the thing saying, buy war bonds. You might have seen some of those. Well, they had Cinderella stamps saying, the blue train will be arriving in your town. And then the postmaster would stamp the date. And so people getting the letters coming into the area would actually know that the blue train was coming on such and such a date. So the newspapers would also advertise the impending arrival of the blue trains and the Cinderella stamps were issued with dates that trains would be in each town. Now, having the greatest number of recruits uh, accepted for the prestigious air roles became a matter of civic pride with each town preparing their best and brightest for the arrival of the train. Newspapers regularly rang stories promoting recruitment and they spurred the competition between rival towns to have the highest number of recruits. The Manning River Times, an advocate for the North Coast District of New South Wales reported, we are rapidly raising an air arm powerful enough to hop, knock Hitler off his feet. Do you think you can add an ounce of drive to the punch? If so, go along to the recruiting train, strike while the iron's hot. Candidates approaching the train found the first carriage fielded inquiries into ground air crew roles, as we can see there. You see their face out the windows and that's in, can we point there? See the man pointing out and these guys are out on the, the platform leaning in. Um, so in carriage one, they would field the, the inquiries into the ground air crew role, uh, into air crew and ground crew roles. The carriage also accommodated room for an initial, uh, an initial interview. And if successful, there was a three man interview board there, all in the first carriage. Those suitable then took a Morse adaptability test on site in the train. Carriage two held a doctor and two medical orderlies and they conducted a full physical, including chest x-rays. So they had a chest x-ray machine that traveled with them and a specialist eye examination for pilots. In carriage three, the successful candidate completed their enlistment paperwork, they were sworn in and they were given um, a RAF reservist badge. Now the RAF reservist badge came about because of the white feather incidents. So people signed up for RAF reserve, had to wait around until they were called up and they didn't want them getting badgered by people saying that they weren't, weren't um, brave enough to be joining up and maybe then going off to the army. So they gave them a RAF reservist badge. The Broken Hill newspaper reported, these trains are a masterpiece of efficiency. The recruit enters the train at one end and if accepted, leaves the other end wearing a badge, indicating that he's in the Air Force Reserve and likely to be called up at any tick of a clock. 
Now, while waiting on the reserve list, the men were expected to complete a course of study. Obviously, they, they not everyone had the same aptitude um, to prepare them for flying duties. In 1939, for example, only 28% of those aged 14 to 17 were still in school and just 8% of students had completed school. So to compensate, all recruits were given a copy of something called the 21 Lessons that was devised. And it was a pre-enlistment education program designed to raise their education level. Through these lessons, the reservists became competent in arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, and mechanics, all with special reference to aeronautics and navigation. So actually quite a set of 21 lessons just recently. So very, very hard to find. Um, the blue trains were so successful it's, um, I found that more than 70% of RAF recruits can be attributed to the trains. The Dubbo Liberal and Macquarie Advocate recording, reporting on the recruitment effort at Merigonong, Merigonong, a small township in northwestern New South Wales, noted that they had set a recruiting record with 15 young men enrolled as aircrew and a further five provisionally accepted as aircrew. The recruitment office was quoted as saying, this is a remarkable performance for such a small town. We did not expect to get more than one or two. Statistically though, four of these men wouldn't return to their homes. Despite this, men keep lining up for the blue trains and the consistent message from the newspaper of the day was the whistle of the blue train will be heard in your district shortly. Make sure you answer the call. So women in the Air Force. There's always been the tradition of nursing positions as we know. Um, that were assisted in times of war. However, the RAF was the first Australian service to establish a women's force. Women working in the Air Force began with the Women's Air Training Corps, just out here at Ambly, uh, 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 sorry, at Archerfield, not Ambly, at Archerfield, at the um, Royal Aero Club, the old Royal Aero Club. They used to train there and they had an office in Adelaide Street, I think it was in the city. Uh, in Brisbane, they, uh, that began in April, 1939. They performed engine and aircraft maintenance and formed a motor transport section. Um, as the movement expanded across Australia, it transformed, becoming in March 1941, the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force, or WAAF. Women quickly began replacing men in non-active roles and to relieve them for air crew positions. They began with roles of uh, initially a fabric worker, tailor, cook, clerk, driver and telephonist. Early in 1943, Air Minister um, Arthur Drakeford announced that the first two women WAFs were to begin training as link instructors. That's a link there. I'm sure you all, uh, it's a, more, it's a more, notable, more notable crowd this time, so I don't have to describe what a link is to most people, but the link trainer. So they announced that the women would be training um, as link instructors. Now the link was specially designed, ground trainer used to teach future pilots. The women had given up their recreation leave to train as pilots and were granted extra leave from their jobs as transport drivers at a seaplane base to allow them to complete their training. Aircraft's woman, Leela Gorey from Leeton in New South Wales in New, uh, and ACW Joan Morley from Wellington, New South Wales, both excelled in their basic flying training with each of them soloing after just six hours of instruction. You got up to 10 normally. Uh, despite the above average performance and indicative of the struggle faced by women entering a male dominated field, Gorey told one newspaper that the pilots laugh when they hear that a woman will be instructing airmen. Ultimately, women were employed in 60 different roles from pilot down with a total of 26,245 women serving in the WAF. Unfortunately, when the war ended, the WAF was progressively demobilized until it was completely disbanded in July, 1947. And then women finally re-entered the Air Force as part of the WAF, W Women's Australian Air Force, or Women's Royal Australian Air Force in 1950. So 1941, following on from Britain's example, this time following someone else, Australia formed the, Empire, uh, formed the um, Air Training Corps. The short-term objective of the Corps was to provide pre-enlistment training for boys aged 16 to 18 who intended joining the RAF as air or ground crew during World War II. Now, though it was continually stressed to the cadets during the time that there was no obligation to enlist, the ATC was undoubtedly designed to funnel prepared trainees into the Empire Training Scheme. Now, initially joining the Air Training Corps was contingent upon parental approval, and originally the boys joining the Air Training Corps were required to give an honourable undertaking that they would join the RAF when they reached age 18. However, this provision was quickly removed likely due to parental backlash and a corresponding drop in ATC applications at the time. 
Now, newspapers did their best to appease parents' concerns over their boys joining. The Morning Herald um, reported, the lad who is 16 today may yet be called upon to serve his country when he reaches the age of 18. The wise parent, realising this and knowing that his or her son is so minded, may well appreciate the advantage of two years full training as preparation both for war and a time when we'll have to face the world under conditions of peace. So not a bad little advertisement to get your son in. Ultimately, 12,000 boys enlisted in wartime RAF after training in ATC, which undoubtedly eased the shock of basic training and trade training and ensured a higher number of graduating airmen ready for duty. How many of these were amongst the 10,000 RAF fatalities is unknown but I'm sure if we ever found out, it'd shock the hell out of us. Now, number 76 squadron in Fremantle, Western Australia, provides a typical example of the pathway between the Air Training Corps and the war in Europe. The squadron was ably commanded by local school teacher and hockey star, Robert Reitz, who was the flight lieutenant in charge of 76 squadron ATC, compiled a book listing the boys who progressed into service. Though acknowledged as not a complete list, Reitz notes 59 boys who went to air crew positions and a, th a further 38 into ground crew positions. Now, Douglas Buchanan Abel is the first name on the air crew list. He enlisted in the RAF 11 days after his 19th birthday and completed his initial training at Pierce, Western Australia. He was assigned as an air gunner and did 24 weeks of training at number one wireless air gunner school, WAG school at Ballarat, followed by four weeks training at number three bombery and gunnery school in West Salem, Victoria. He departed Australia and after 45 days at sea, he arrived in England, where he completed operational training and then a conversion course. During this time, the trainees formed their air crews at conversion courses and trained as a crew on the aircraft that they would be operating. On completion, a Burl's crew was posted to number 460 squadron on 9 November 1943. 12 days later, a Burl was dead. Among the 25 aircraft from 460 Lancaster ED644 took off, from RAF Binbrook late on the afternoon of 23rd November 1943 on a mission to bomb Berlin. The aircraft was never heard from again. After the war, it was established that the aircraft had been hit by heavy flak. Three of the crew, including a Burl, perished, and the remaining four were taken as POWs and survived the war. A Burl and his two crewmates are interned at Reichwald Forest Cemetery in Cleves in Germany. 12 days. Okay, so here's some of the things. It's a bit small for this type of screen. But this is um, your progression through training, initial training, pilots do 12 weeks, observers, etc. Then pilots come down here, elementary flying school for 12 weeks, service flying training. You're pointing with me, eh? Thank you. And then service flying training, and then off to the embarkation after completing 50, 36, and so on. You can follow the chart. I'll let you all do that on your own time. And over here, I've compiled a chart of all the training schools for you. So natural recruitment for aircrew was selective and many found it difficult to meet the criteria. One of the guys from the Air Training Corps, I'll go back to that, Raymond Jones, one of my favourite stories. Talk about perseverance. A railway porter from Cairns was desperate to serve. In 1940, age 16 years, Jones joined the Army Cadets with number 51 Battalion. Unfortunately, the unit disbanded five months later and Jones was then persuaded to join Queensland Railways as a way of contributing on the home front. However, this meant that he unconsciously barred himself from any chance of service because it was an essential service. Jones variously attempted to gain release and to resign from the railways. Both were refused. In November 1943, he joined number 63 wing ATC Cairns in Queensland, knowing that this was likely his only opportunity to gain release from the um, railway duties as aircrew training had priority over any of the essential home services. Unfortunately, Jones failed to pass the increased academic requirements at the time that had been brought in as the war in Europe needed end and a reduction in recruitment was required to accommodate for the surplus of aircrew. Um, while Jones was recommended for ground crew training, this didn't negate the essential service component of his railway service. A string of letters Jones sent to both the railway requesting release from service and to the National Service Office in Cairns pleading to be accepted in the RAF may have drawn sympathy for his plight and admiration for his enthusiasm, but the letters failed to gain um, Jones access into the service. Then in December, 1944, Jones demonstrated exceptional courage whilst on duty as a railway porter. A fire erupted near a, depo a bomb storage depot um, close to his station and Jones raced to fight the fire. 
who's reported at times standing on bombs using just a branch and wet rags to fight back flames. Twice he narrowly escaped deaths as bombs exploded nearby, once knocking him unconscious before he regained consciousness and resumed fighting the fire, all the time with shrapnel flying all around him. For his gallantry, Jones was awarded the British Empire Medal. Soon after, the commanding officer number three recruitment section wrote to the National Service Officer suggesting Jones's enlistment in the RAF as a holder of the British Empire Medal would be inspiration to other cadets. This led to Jones being enlisted and sent to signal schools for training as a telegraph operator. He was still in training at the war end and discharged on the 12th of September, 1945. But that's perseverance. So onto the kindergarten of modern warfare. Um, it's a quote from my book um, about the training. They called it obviously the, the training of the Empire training pilots. They called it the kindergarten of modern warfare. Now training pilots were provided only short lessons before taking controls and they would alternate ultimately between being shown what to do um, and then flying solo. So they'd be shown, solo, shown, solo. Um, and they were expected to solo within 10 hours of flying. Arthur Sandell explains his first flight in Tiger Moth as a trainee pilot. So straight from the newspaper of this guy in his letter home. From the start, my instructor left me in no doubt that teaching others to fly was not what he had chosen to do in the RAF. It seemed to be his policy to scare the daylights out of the pupil on his first flight by demonstrating the complete aerobatic capacity of that little plane, including stall turns, a barrel roll, inverted flying, and a loop the loop. Having shown that none of these gut-wrenching maneuvers ripped the wings off the plane, he settled down in subsequent flying sessions to teach the pupil to fly straight and level and to execute three-point landings. Later on, as we saw, the link trainer became an essential part of pilot training and many new pilots experienced crashes in the safety of the link trainer. The link provided valuable flying experience that undoubtedly saved many lives um, in the accelerated training regime of the Empire Trains scheme. I've got a little thing here from the link. So Link was capable of producing almost fly any flying scenario. Uh, Peter said he had flown one. So any flying scenario, um, as the following would, would be pilot can attest. So this is a guy out of the Link. I felt my seat trying to slide me onto the floor as the machine stalled. Then suddenly the cockpit was spinning round and round, gathering speed with every passing second. I know now what it's like to crash. I never want to repeat the experience. My small world was tumbling earthward. <laughs> The instruments went mad. The needles flickered chaotically over the dials. I began to perspire as I wrestled with the controls. Impossibly, um, impossible to think clearly. The plane was lurching sickeningly like a ship in a very rough sea. Nothing I could do would bring the nose up again. Calmly and from a long way off, I heard the instructor asking me if I'd forgotten the throttle. I had completely. Dimly, I remembered to put the stick forward to gain flying speed. Yes, and right rudder to counteract the spin. With the droning of the electric motors drumming in my ears, I at last leveled it up. I was hot, flustered, and not far from being airsick when I climbed out. The instructor greeted me with, I suppose you know you crashed. I didn't need to be told. <laughs> <laughs> Another important decision in a pilot's life during training was whether they would be flying fighters or bombers. This decision was made for them when they arrived at their service flying training school. All pilots were aware of the life expectancy of bomber crews flying missions in Europe. Not that pilot pilots, uh, not the fighter pilots fared much better. And one ecstatic pilot selected for fighters wrote home to his father. The impossible has been fulfilled in defiance of providence and the mysterious way of divinity that regulates the Air Force. I'm flying mosquitoes. I don't have to emulate their, their virtues to you, as you've probably read all about them. They really are superb in every way, and I am really most fortunate to be on them at all. It means, above all other things, that life and operations will be lengthened by something like six minutes and 40 seconds, which I find most encouraging. <laughs> okay, Article 15 squadrons. Man, it's dark in here. So it would do me no justice um, to try and explain all the Article 15 squadrons to you and to recount the deeds of the, in such a short time. So instead, I'm going to relate a few short stories to give you an idea of what life was like in an active squadron. There we go. Thanks, Peter. Um, the first, number 50 squadron, nicknamed the Desert Harassers, one of my favourite ones. The squadron flew operations in every engagement, both supporting and following each movement of the American 8th Army, constantly relocating and establishing bases and airfields as they went. Jack Bartell, BFC, commanding officer of 450 Squadron, told the Australian Women's Weekly, from um, the Egyptian desert El Amain, 
to rain-soaked muddy fields in Foggia in Italy, we fought every inch of the way. In the Battle of Sangrio in Italy, they were part of the famous cab rank, as Montgomery named it, where planes sat and just flew in turns to support the troops. Uh, squadrons waited to be hailed in support of ground troops. The cab rank's purpose was to provide, to provide constant close air support for ground operations during periods of intense operation. One war correspondent who witnessed the action reported Australian soldiers clinging, dim, dim, uh, clinging grimly to their captured ridges look up with grins of pleasure at the snow-coloured white, uh, snow white bellies of the kitty hawks and bombers as they fly over with the regularity of a suburban train service. While the supporting troops may have enjoyed seeing the squadrons overhead, the enemy aircraft uh, gunners fled in terror on seeing the dive bombing attackers. They knew that only a lucky direct hit on the aircraft would stop the diving um, aircraft from delivering their blow. With 12 aircraft diving in unison, each armed with six machine guns, the enemy below had 72 guns spraying incendiaries and armor piercing bullets down on their positions, knowing that within seconds between 24 and 48 bombs, each 250 pounds would follow. Wing Commander George Howden, DFC, commanding officer of 456 Squadron, explained the difficulties faced by their squadron in the role keeping the Bay of Biscay, so on to 456, Bay of Biscay safe from Allied um, aircraft hunting German U-boats. And I love the quote at the end of this. The squadron, he said, was often called on to clear the Junker JU-88s from the Bay of Biscay. And he called this the perfect vicious circle. The Junkers, he said, are looking for the Sunderlands, which are looking for U-boats, which are looking for convoys. We mosquitoes are looking for Junkers in order to protect the Sunderlands. And all the time, Fokker Wolf 190s are looking for us. And finally, I told some people at start, I always get teary. This is um, the impressions of what it's like to be on a bombing mission with a heavy bomber. So if I can get you all, everyone dip your head and close your eyes for a second and listen to what I say. So this is a direct quote. Come onto the airfield with me and watch the Australian squadron take off. It's 10 p.m. and still full daylight as the crew stand by the Lancasters at dispersal points. A crowd of 100 or so is already assembled. Although scarcely a night goes past on which members of the squadron do not go off to some mission or another, there's always a crowd to watch them leave. It does not always consist of the same people, but there is always someone to see the planes off. In the crowd, you'll find the lowest ranking WAFs and multi-stripe battle-hardened flyers wearing two or more decorations, who after 40 or more operations still know the feeling of utter loneliness in the moment in which the plane pauses at the takeoff point, waiting for the green light and the crew looks out at the crowd clustered round. The first plane taxis up, pauses for a second or two for the final test of the motors, and then the pilot gives them full power. As the plane passes you 40 feet away, it almost drowns you in a sea of sound, which surges down through your very lungs. Everybody gives the thumbs up sign. I join in a bit self-consciously, but it's only people like myself seeing this for the first time who feel self-conscious. Suddenly you realize what it all means. The WAFs are straining on their very toes. Some with both arms raised far as they can reach in the sky. The men on the ground are raising their thumbs up high to emphasize mission of, the message of good luck to the men in the planes. But the thumbs up sign of these people is not the orthodox symbol of victory that we usually associate with it. It's a prayer that these men in the planes will come back. An affirmation of faith that they will a desperate mystic attempt to project into the minds of the men, whatever it is that might help bring them back. Inside the plane, all the members of the crew are signaling back with their thumbs up raised. Gratefully, hungrily, they seize to the tie with the people before the battle. And now you know why it's always a crowd there to see them off. Tell we go. <laughs> um, as the plane hunches down to the job of lifting 12,000 pound bomb load off the runway, you find yourself waving your thumb as fervently as the rest, unheard in the roar, shouting, come back, come back. So, setting off for a bomber crew. All right, myths and mysteries. Given the Empire Air Training Scheme was one, if not the largest, greatest military contribution Australia has done through World War II, it seems counterintuitive that so many people haven't heard or know about um, Australia's contribution. Three enduring myths are usually linked to why the Empire Training Scheme is not commemorated in Australia. As Bomber Command and the war in Europe usually dominate any discussion of the scheme, it's inevitable that the fall of Singapore and Australia 
um, turning it back on Britain for an alliance with the United States is raised. So it's always that myth about Britain deserted us and we turned to America. So that's one of the myths. The second myth, Crawford, as a reason for each being forgotten, is a tactic at the end of the war to target civilian populations and subsequent uh, firebombing of Dresden. Both of these constructs have no real support. This leaves us with the question of why the Empire Air Training Scheme is not remembered in Australia as the greatest wartime achievement. So let's look at myths. I'll see if I can dispel them for you. Okay, when Japan entered the war, there was talk within the newspaper of Australia being deserted by Britain. However, these reports were short-lived. It was mostly the agenda at that time of Australian Prime Minister John Curtin and was vastly outnumbered by um, articles acknowledging Britain's own difficulties at the time. The Arcadia Conference between Britain and the USA took place in Washington just two weeks after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. A key outcome of the conference was the Germany first policy. A memorandum from the conference dated 24 December 41 states, much has happened since February last, but notwithstanding the enemy of Japan into the war, entering of Japan into the war. Our view remains that Germany is still the prime enemy and her defeat is key to victory. Once Germany is defeated, the collapse of Italy and the defeat of Japan must follow. In our considered opinion, therefore, it should be cardinal principle of A, B strategy that only the minimum force necessary for safeguarding of vital interests in other theatres should be diverted from operations against Germany. That's the Arcadia Conference. Then we back that up with, at the conference, the world was divided into strategic areas of control with America delegated responsible for the Pacific region. So America had control of us. Newspapers at the time reported Churchill's assessment that Japan's invasion of Australia, although possible, is only most likely, most remotely likely. So they didn't see that they were gonna invade us either. However, despite, agreement, uh, um, despite agreeing that Japan's invasion of Australia would be hazardous and dangerous venture, Curtin continued his um, invasion rhetoric throughout Australia. Now, highly accurate polling using the Gallup method, we've talked about polls now and how bad they are, but in the early days, I've got a full assessment of the Gallup, Morgan Gallup polls. Um, they were the duck's guts, basically, of polling in the early day. Um, and they were conducted to assess Australian population's feelings on the alliance. Now, one of the questions, what they did in, during the war years, just to give you a quick background of the, have I got enough time? During the, um, during the war years, um, the Morgan Gallup poll came to Australia and it was published only in newspapers and the newspapers purchased, it was done free of charge Morgan Gallup polls and sold the newspapers the findings for newspapers then to report the findings back. Uh, and that's how they made their money, basically to fund the polls. So it was a, an altruistic type of system. Um, now, one of the polls asked, after the war, would you favour or oppose a permanent military alliance between the British Empire and America? The results revealed 82% of Australians were in favour of the British um, Empire forming an ongoing alliance with the United States, obviously for protection. However, Australians still considered themselves aligned with and part of the British Empire. Another question posed, which of these things would you like Australia to do? Join with Britain and the other dominions in a common foreign policy or decide for itself how she should deal with foreign countries? The poll revealed once again, two thirds majority of Australians preferred to align with Britain and the other dominions when deciding foreign policy. So clearly there was no change in alliance during that perceived period with Britain. The firebombing of Dresden um, occurred over the 14th and 15th of February, 1945. And it was the embodiment of the bombing campaign Britain had warned was coming to the Germans. Newspapers began reporting the destruction within a day. So when they say we didn't know about it, newspapers were reporting within a day. And over the next weeks, they relayed the full extent of the damage to the Australian public. By, Mar by early March, reports picked up from the German press were relaying the to the Australian public on the front newspapers. Typical headlines announced Dresden wiped out, Dresden off Europe's map, and wiped out Dresden, a city of the past. The news articles confirmed the destruction of Dresden and with more than a million people living in the city, the massive loss of life. The stories told how in the narrow streets of Dresden, the raging fires spread irresistibly, sucking the oxygen from the streets and killing those within. Absolute horror. So hard, hard to imagine nowadays. The Australian people read stories like not one single building remains, 10,000 citizens are buried in the ruins. The town area is now devoid of human life and buildings are beyond, beyond reconstruction. Dresden has been wiped off the map of Europe. There's no argument that the Australian people didn't know what had happened. So then we have to look at what their reaction to it was. 
A poll taken two months later in May 1945 specifically asked Australians, in your opinion, how should the German people be treated after the war? The results revealed 57% of the nation wanted the German people treated either severely or harshly, with 31% opting for moderately and only 8% said they should be treated leniently. But even knowing all about Dresden, they still had a, a dislike for the German population. So I cannot see um, many wanted the German people at that stage. One of the questions and the comments was they wanted it regulated to an agriculture nation and divided and ruled by the allied nations or the German people forced to rebuild the devastation of the war wreaked across Europe. So clearly Dresden wasn't a reason to dismiss it from the Empire Training Scheme from the collective memory of Australians. So I think that's a hindsight. It's a, it's a contemporary view based on our opinions now rather than an opinion of the time. So why isn't it remembered? From a total of 51,114 Australian air crew recruits, 27,387 graduated from Australia, another 9,606 completed their training in Canada and 583 were trained in Rhodesia. For a total of 37,576 Australian air crew trained under EATS. There are further 4,098 air crews still in training in Australia when the scheme was abruptly ceased in March 1945. More than 300 Australian aircrew were killed in flying accidents, part of EAT, 231 in Australia, 65 in Canada, and 23 in Rhodesia. And once they reached their squadrons, 9,874 aircrew were killed or listed as missing, never found. The aircrew Australia committed to EATS accounted to only 3.75% of all Australian serving personnel during World War II. Let that sink in. They're only 3.7% or 6.7% of those who served overseas. However, the aircrew killed amounted to almost 25% of all Australian fatalities during the war. This made serving in EATS amongst the most hazardous duties during the war. Just over 22,000 of the 37,576 graduates served outside of the Australian Article 15 squadrons I showed you, in RAF units all over the world, some in groups, some being the only Australian in their squadron. Schemes personnel served in bomber, coastal, fighter command, um, as well as army cooperation units, Middle East squadrons, and transport and flying training commands. While Australian flyers were so widely spread, it was impossible to separate the impact they made on the war in the air from the efforts of the British or the other dominions, and Australian airmen effectively became unsung heroes of the war. To record all of this, Australia employed just one public relation officer in contrast to Canada's 16. My belief is the Empire Training Scheme is largely unknown and not commemorated due to the magnitude of the scheme. Australians love to celebrate an Australian achievement, but to do this, they like a definitive outcome, a tangible event, a resounding victory against the odds or a terrible loss in the face of defiant resistance. Ultimately, the men and women of the Empire Training Scheme achieved a great outcome as part of a coalition of Dominion forces, flying mixed nationality crews, often in British squadrons that most Australians will never ever hear about. And while individuals like Victorian Cross recipients, Hume Middleton, Bill Newton um, are recognised and famous squadrons like 460 Squadron or their even more famous Lancaster bomber, G for George, have received their just accolades. The Empire Air Training Team, in my opinion, as a whole remains largely under unfamiliar and underappreciated. And I think it's the magnitude of the scheme that makes it just impossible to recognise. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I wonder if we have some questions to follow up. I'm sure some people will have some. Are there any questions from this floor first before we take people from Zoom? Okay, do some of the Zoomers have their hands up? I was pleased to hear you mention 450 Squadron, yep. um, the Desert Harassers. My father served on 450 Squadron and I'm known as a child of 450. We continue the association. Um, often 450 was overshadowed by three squadron, yeah. but 450 um, relished its um, title of desert harassers, which was given to it by, um, well, they took it. Uh, it was an insult from Lord um, Hall. Oh, oh, oh. yep. Yes, but in true Aussie form, um, they decided that they would uh, take that as their um, 
their title, the desert harasses, and on their as we do, like the rats of Trabrook. Yes, and yes. and, and uh, they have um, on the squadron um, emblem the, the name harass, and they certainly did that. And it was a moving squadron. Um, at times, they moved, um, you know, a dozen times in a couple of weeks on these landing grounds that they prepared. And if you think about the logistics of this through the, the North Africa, the Western Desert, um, the men living in tents and um, uh, preparing airfields and then the aircraft, um, which were camouflaged in different places, then having to fly in and find these progressive landing grounds and the sand and the dirt and being able to maintain those those kitty hawk those really tough kitty hawk aircraft to um, continue um, chasing rommel out of north africa uh, and then they went to malta and and um, sicily and then uh, right up through um, italy and were at the forefront of the liberation of rome yeah, so um, there's a great story about it, 450 squadron meeting the pope yeah and they had all the dignitaries all the high ranking people that to meet the pope and then all the different military ranks all the way down and they had the section of australian airmen and the pope came out and spotted them from a distance he said ah australians god's children and walked all the way down and spoke to them okay can everybody hear me yep. yes, yes. Okay, good. Yes. I just wanted to say, Peter, thanks for uh, such a, an interesting angle on, on collecting the, uh, the information that built, built this uh, book of yours. Uh, uh, the, the, the average guy puts a, uh, a historian, uh, comes at it from a totally different angle. Uh, my father was a, an EATS guy. He uh, started in the militia, though he was always in the, uh, heading for the RAF. Uh, he became a, a navigator uh, in Australia and went via the EAHS to Canada, uh, became an astronav, uh, and because of that, did not go to Bomber Command, which was extremely lucky for him. Uh, he crewed up in, uh, in the Bahamas uh, in an anti-submarine squadron, uh, and they then took a... Uh, they went to Canada, Ottawa, Flew a brand new Liberator to India, right right across the world. It was just on twenty at the time, which is pretty pretty good. Uh, and then uh, uh, went down to uh, Ceylon as, as uh, to become a uh, general reconnaissance squadron and chase submarines across the uh, Indian Ocean. So I'm only here courtesy of not being in bomber command. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, I made a comment earlier that um, I had a, I flew the link trainer. Yes. Um, I used to go down to the RAF headquarters in Sturt Street in Townsville after school. And there was a link trainer in the basement of the building. And we'd just walk up to the office and say, can we go and fly the link trainer? This is me and sub senior, me and my mate. So I you know, say, so yeah. So we went down and we taught ourselves how to fly the link trainer. So uh, that was my experience with the link trainer. I put it, Townsville, yeah, Sturt Street, 13 Sturt Street. Uh, the other comment was um, my father-in-law was a pilot of the G for George. Yep. He flew G for George on a mission to Germany. Um, came back, okay, and got a DFC as well. He, that squadron lost 1,014 men. They lost their entire squadron complement three times over. 1,014 men were killed in that squadron. Yeah. So the squadron complement three times over. Yep. You, um, you talked about uh, eats being forgotten. Uh, yes. A friend of mine, his uh, father flew in RAF 110 squadron in Burma. So a forgotten war through a forgotten system in a forgotten plane. He yes. was a wireless air gunner in a Volte Vengeance, which was claimed as being not a very good aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that a uh, United States Army Air Force General complained and didn't want them to be taking up valuable aerodrome space 
but uh, they were very, very good in close support in Burma. And uh, he was telling me stories after he had passed away. I was talking to his son and his wife and telling some of the stories that um, he had told me and their jaws were dropping because they'd never heard these things. So the other forgotten bit was just people not talking about them. So it was a very, very interesting uh, component. I put together, did some research and put together all his operational squadrons from operational record books as, and some of the link to some of the stories he told me as well about what had happened in, in Burma. Oh, very Censorship good. probably uh, presented them writing home and telling people about all this stuff and therefore it never got into any good records. One of my other interesting stories in there is um, when, they, when they turned up in England, the Australians turned up in England, they're often invited to, to um, by the um, Australian Commissioner, High Commissioner in London to go out for morning tea. And sometimes they'd be invited out to the palace. And so they'd go out to the palace and enjoy a, a morning tea at the palace and be escorted around. And that included meeting the king and queen at some stage. And one particular part I've written about in my book is, is a group of airmen who write, they were standing there chatting away, having had their cucumber sandwiches and their cups of tea and, and all, all waiting after having toured the grounds, not knowing if they will or will not meet the royals. And then, all hell broke loose as a couple of corgis come flying into the room, scattering around, and before they knew it, there's the king and queen, and they meet the king and queen. But in amongst that, of course, that's the queen mother. In amongst that, they talk to the young daughters, which is Queen Elizabeth now, and one of them asked her, posed her the question, he's scared by the raids, and she said her comment was, it's not half as scary as the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So there's some, there's some, it wasn't just their experience of war. These men went away and gained incredible, valuable insights into the world. Um, some of them got to see the Jewish nation forming and, you know, in Palestine and Egypt and uh, at the end of the war and, and how that was formed. And, and I've written about that as well. And so those type of experiences, um, you know, different things that they saw, different things they experienced besides war. And you're talking about the 450 um, and how they move constantly. Um, often they'd be overrun. They'd basically be overrun by the enemy because they couldn't move back. They'd get the aircraft out, but the ground crew and some of the pilots might be, might be taken, and, and they did. And there's stories of, that I come across of um, people being held in, in temporary compounds by the enemy, and then the ground's taken back and they're released, or, or um, they, they do an air attack. They come in, they know they're in a temporary compound, they do an air attack. To distract them and they just climb over the wire and run home the four or five kilometers it's not very or four or five miles it's not very far so they they run back to the base and get back so uh, just a, a different kind of life you know you're just hard to imagine i have a question from the floor here philip Hall. Yeah, I'd like to just change the uh, nature of the questions a little bit it's a, a fascinating story of how it's all come together, but I'm really interested in how you actually went about gathering all the data, pulling it all together and collating it in such a way. I mean, 35,000 newspaper articles is a huge amount. How did you actually go about doing that? Good question. Can I have a humble brag here? Um, I, I, I'm not a programmer by any means, but I'm an, I'm an aircraft engineer originally, so a framey, and I know I've, I've learned from that that if I can think of it, someone else has done it. So um, at that stage, when I was writing my undergraduate papers, Nambour, which is my hometown, I wrote a history of the rural schools with my PhD, and Nambour had, become, had won a, a contract to digitise the newspapers, and it was the first one in Australia to start digitising newspapers, and that got me interested in newspapers being digitised and how valuable that would ultimately be, and that's before Trove was started. And then when I got when I won the book, it was to base it on newspaper of the day, and I knew Trove was just starting and it was in its infancy, and there was a lot of stuff in there, but how to access it all was was um, was still unknown. So I hunted around and I found the language I had to use for something called Python. I still don't know Python, and I found someone who had programs, a guy named Rag, who Tim Sherritt, who writes a lot of stuff and a great man. And um, he had a program that would 
download stuff, but it wouldn't collate it properly. So I then found a program in Python that would collate stuff. And then I fiddled around until I actually built a bridge that would do the two. So what I ultimately ended up with, it took me a couple of months to get, end up with um, a program in this Python language that would download newspaper articles, turn them into PDF, put them into a file by their year date in date order. And so ultimately I, I said, I set the parameters of my search and then I told Trove, this is what I want. And it downloaded all the newspaper articles for 1939 in date order as PDF files into a 1939 folder, if you imagine that, and then 1940, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, and so on. So I had that. Um, and then ultimately what I did was I then went in and used Adobe Acrobat and got one lot of PDFs and turned them into a single book, basically. So now I have a book of 1939 of all the newspaper articles pertinent to the subject I was searching. Um, and, and that's what I did was I created these books like that. The funny part of it, the humble brag is um, I set it all up and I finally got it running. I tested it a few times and it ran. I set it up to download overnight to do my 60 something thousand searches that I had. I come back in the morning and it hadn't completed. And I thought what was wrong? And then I got a phone call from Trove <laughs> from the Australian Archive, from, from the Australian National Library. I'd crashed Trove overnight. <laughs> You broke it. I broke Trove. <laughs> so they asked me what I was doing, and they were they were they were very complimentary and they were very helpful, and and so we set about working out how we could do it. But I effectively did what was when I wrote the book. It's it's highly achievable now. But when I did it, um, it, it was brand new and it's in its infancy. And my whole thing was, could I write a book from my armchair? And my daughter said, if I had wheels on my chair and could get to the fridge, I wouldn't have moved. <laughs> so. You need to download Trove in smaller patches instead of one of the big ones. Yes. So that, that does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. I, I figured Trove must have been in there somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it was Trove, but it was very early on. So, um, and then of course, supported by once I knew stuff and I had to then verify it, I'd go to, you know, service records or I, I you know, the good historian methodology is triangulate your evidence. So, I, I try and try again, triangulate all my evidence. All right, anybody in the big Zoom world out there got a question? Tony, I found that, uh, that address most interesting. And I really yeah, thank you for that. You did mention something which I think you said occurred in Cairns. And I lived in Cairns for some years. So that, that's why my ear picked up. Question, the fellow that was uh, fighting a fire was, did you say he was standing on a bomb at the time? He was standing on a pile of bombs, Roger. On and a pile of bombs. Right. Now, what, was it in Cairns or near Cairns or where was it? Do you remember? It was next to the Cairns station, yes. I can find out which particular station for you, if you like. I've got all that in my research at home. His name's mm. Raymond Jones. And if you, do you use Trove at all? Yes, I do. So if you uh, search, if you is, search is Raymond he... Jones... You don't mean you don't mean the ex mayor of Cairns, I Ray Jones. If, I, I would love to know if he's the ex mayor. I didn't find. Oh, sorry. Him. No, 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 no. Sorry, he was the member for Cairns for a long time, Ray Jones. I would love to know if he's the same person. See if he <laughs> or maybe been, he was. See if he's been awarded an Empire Medal. No, oh, maybe, maybe. Okay, so it was in Cairns, near, near near a railway station in Cairns. Yes, he was a railway porter. And he ran to the bomb storage facility that was next to the railway line, obviously for convenient movement, but isolated enough so that if anything happened, it wouldn't destroy everything, I would assume. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a grass fire broke out and he ran over and was putting out the fire on the bombs and the mm -hmm. bombs were blowing up around him, charging mm -hmm. off. He was, he was actually reported people, not one, not a no, number of people saw him knocked unconscious by one of the explosions. And he lay there in amongst the fire with the bomb still exploding around him. <laughs> then he regained consciousness, stood up and continued fighting the fire. Mm. Yes. I remember that I uh, understand there was a, a bomb dump near Waree, W-O-R-E-E, -E, which is in the southeastern area of Cairns, not too far from the railway line. So perhaps it was somewhere there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I'd love to know more. I'd love to know what happened to him. Anyone else? Are there any other questions? 
Yes, go ahead, your comment. Oh, it's about um, Evans Head Aerodrome. Yes. Um, and you had a list there of all the uh, aerodromes and bases that were set up um, in Australia. So we had a lot of um, infrastructure which we benefited from That's uh, right. after the war. Evans Head was the largest um, training base established um, in the Southern Hemisphere. Yes. And um, uh, I've been connected um, with it through my parents um, having uh, people who served on Evans Head. They, they had reunions there. Over, over the years and um, uh, my father was on this base when um, Sir Valston Hancock was um, there setting it up originally and um, I knew I got to know a number of the veterans who'd served there and each year they'd have a, a reunion a service at the um, um, at the cemetery where there's a number of graves uh, and a number of um, uh, RAF people who've been who were killed who either were killed in, in training, accidents. Yeah. Yes. One of my Facebook friends through through writing the book is a gentleman named Heldon Boyd, who's oh yes, yes. Uh, I know. So, no, yeah, so yes, yeah, 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 so. yeah, yes, and and so these people they all knew about the Empire Air Training Scheme, and one of them, Gene Horton James, who was a driver in, in the WAF on the base. She used to always say, I don't know why people don't know about the Empire Air Training Scheme. That's right. And, and anyway, the sad thing is that this wonderful uh, base, um, we've got a committee trying to save the aerodrome from um, the Richmond Valley Council who yeah. keep carving off land to set up uh, housing estates and so on and um, uh, we are fortunate that um, the one Bellman hangar that um, survived um, was restored and uh, the impetus to that was um, through committee um, getting an F-111 yes. uh, to be uh, housed there and there's also a local um, uh, community museum and it contains a lot of yeah. Air Force memorabilia including um, my late mother's uh, intact WAF complete WAF um, winter uniform wow. which is listed on um, a heritage register Very good. Yeah. but um, we need more support to help you save this aerodrome um, I agree. There's not just yours. There's so many aerodromes across mm, Australia mm. as well, and and, and heritage. Um, one of the points you touched on there that I I don't normally get this much time, so I have to be brief. So one of one of the points you touched on there is the legacy of the Empire Air Training Scheme, and you said about the the um, the aircraft and the manufacturing. And if you think of Australia in 1939, we had no manufacturing industry. So in order to actually start producing aircraft in Australia. We couldn't just start building, uh, building aircraft. We didn't have the tools. We had to actually manufacture the tools before we could actually manufacture the aircraft. And we had to train people to manufacture tools before we could teach them to manufacture aircraft from those tools. So our entire manufacturing industry began with the Empire Training Scheme and was funded by the Empire Training Scheme, that 55 million pounds. All the airfields that we showed you and the legacies in Australia's aviation history, which set us up as a, as a massive aviation industry afterwards, owes its heritage to the Empire Training Scheme. And if you think about it, um, I said about the 21 lessons, the boys going off and getting the 21 lessons in physics, most people in those days didn't complete beyond year nine. Once you reached the compulsory age of education of 14, you left school um, and went to work on a farm. Um, some went on to someone's scholarship. Um, even if you won scholarship, there's no guarantee you could go off because your parents couldn't afford to send you to the high school, which might mean boarding somewhere. So the education level was raised significantly by the Empire Trainer Scheme in these 21 lessons and the boys going out learning how to do physics, trigonometry, navigation, um, the whole lot, yeah, the, the math skills. Um, it, it just raised the level. 
And the 21 lessons that when I said I got a complete set, Top and Wall has a set, which I found out recently. Um, but 21 lessons is unique to get a set of them because what would happen was a student would be sent lesson one and he would complete lesson one and then send it in for marking and then he would be sent lesson two. And so I can't see them keeping lesson one after it, it's needed. It wasn't ever, you know, he's finished that and they would have been destroyed. So you don't see too many of them around. So to get a complete set of 21 lessons is really rare because, you know, someone might have lesson seven is all they got to or lesson, you might have got to lesson 21. But to have the complete set is quite rare. So I managed to get a hold of a complete set of um, the 21 lessons, which is... Did you do the lessons yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no. I looked, I looked at it and I thought, uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of math in my career, obviously. And um, I looked at it and I went, wow. Oh, yes. Here's something. <laughs> my book, what should I mention? My book, The Empire Has an Answer, available through Big Sky Publishing. So um, probably almost gone by now. So get a hold of it if you can. Available tonight for $25. $25 as opposed to $35 from Big Sky. And signed. $35 plus $7.95. Yes, there you go. So that's it. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you.